Freezing of gait is one of the major determinants of quality of life in Parkinson's. Uh, we always think of Parkinson's as the disease causing tremor or a few other problems, but in reality, yes, that can be caused by Parkinson's, but what really matters to patient is communication and locomotion. And freezing of gait has a severe impact on locomotion. And not just that, uh, since it's often a sudden um, phenomenon, uh, it, it often leads to falls and falling is a major um, uh, determinant of um, morbidity, but also mortality in Parkinson. So that's why it's really important to, to tackle this problem as, as, as much as we can. Freezing of gates can respond to levodopa. So uh, for most part, uh, freezing of gait can be managed with drugs, uh, but with disease progression or with certain types of diseases, levodopa is not as effective. And uh, in fact, it can also worsen freezing in selected cases. So neuromodulation is seen as an interesting uh, avenue for a variety of reasons, including the fact that you can tackle um, and engage pathways that are not necessarily dopaminergic, and also that you can more, more specifically act on certain areas, particularly the ones involved in gait physiology. So that's why there's an attention on uh, neuromodulation. In terms of my presentation during the MDS, uh, I discussed, uh, I organized the talk in five parts. The first part was um, showing why so far we haven't been successful. That has to do with the problem itself is very variable. Usually patients don't do poorly in the clinic, they have freezing at home, but also the huge placebo effect that can be seen, the poor design of the studies. So there are many reasons why we haven't succeeded uh, as much as we thought um, you know, in this field. Then I, the core of the presentation were three parts, which are um, uh, what the established targets of neuromodulation can do for freezing, what new programming parameters and updates and upgrades of the devices can be uh, uh, doing for this problem. And lastly, the new targets. And I concluded the meeting also indicating what I think about non-invasive neuromodulation, which is also an important uh, and uh, quite, uh, a, quite a, a studied um, approach for, for, for Parkinson's and other diseases in general. So established targets of DBS are subthalamus and globus pallidus. They're both effective for freezing of gait, especially when it's levodopa resist, uh, responsive. But in some people, especially subthalamic stimulation or the procedure itself can worsen freezing. So not infrequently, unfortunately, we see people developing freezing right after surgery. And sometimes that surgery, sometimes, and probably more often, it's the stimulation. So we are now coming to the conclusion that it's important where to stimulate in the brain. It's not just in the subthalamus that the electron needs to be, but also within the certain structure of the subthalamus and even slightly misplaced electrodes, uh, they can actually make things worse. Uh, so this is something that we're learning now that we use neuroimaging. We have newer electrodes allowing us to steer electricity the way we want. Um, so this is what I can say about the established treatments. And then there are um, uh, a, a newer uh, ways to program these devices so that the electrodes will typically be the subthalamus, but we can program the brain in different ways. And I mentioned uh, the use of uh, low frequency stimulation when this can be effective. Uh, it's not always effective. It is effective when the electrode is slightly misplaced, in my opinion. And it, it basically uh, helps um, handling the uh, detrimental effect of stimulation. So you can give stimulation without worsening gait when you use stimulation of frequency uh, of about 60 to 80 hertz. And that's what being called, uh, what's being called uh, low frequency stimulation. Uh, but for sure, the most promising of the newer way to stimulate established target is adaptive stimulation. So adaptive stimulation is a closed loop stimulation is because we have devices now able to record the brain activity. And from the record inside the brain, you can actually uh, respond to it. And the stimulation can have several algorithm paradigms that can be used to stimulate when needed. For example, when freezing of gait is about to happen. Uh, so uh, there are different biomarkers uh, for Parkinson's, the most interesting is beta, which is a particular oscillation of the neurons between 13 and 30 hertz. Uh, we know that beta typically reduces during movement. And therefore, if you record beta while someone walks, you will see that actually the beta is less. 
But uh, new researchers have shown that uh, it's not just that. You need to lock the recording to the particular gate moment. And it's now seen that uh, actually during a freezing episode, exactly when it's about to start, there's a peak of beta, particularly the low beta. Um, and, uh, they, and it's possibly followed by theta in another structure that is a little bit more ventral to the subthalamus that is called substantia nigra pars reticulata. This is just to say that we're learning these signals and uh, that can be used to uh, feed the, the, the loop and stimulate uh, to improve freezing of gait. And this is something that's been shown by studies uh, done in Stanford by Ellen Bronte Stewart and my personal experience as well in patients uh, in experimental trial using adaptive stimulation. So it's, it is something promising and this is promising for two reasons first we can stimulate only when needed and alone this can be useful uh, especially to lessen that detrimental effect of stimulation that i mentioned earlier and secondly and this is perhaps more important stimulation will be given on demand within a certain moment of the gate cycle so stimulation won't be going all the time but it will be alternated in a way uh, and this is something that has been also tried with um, wearables. Uh, so there is a so-called responsive neurostimulation where the stimulator in the subthalamus will be activated by the wearable during a certain part of the gait cycle. Uh, and in one study, this wasn't really effective, but Ellen Brothers Stewart again has done a study um, in looking at uh, wearables not to detect the gait cycle, but to de detect the onset of freezing. And that also has been beneficial. So for sure, there's a lot to, to expect from adaptive deep brain stimulation. At the moment, there are several trials ongoing. Some of them are initiated by investigators. Some others are sponsored by industry. There are at least two industries uh, involved in this field. So there's a lot of action going on. I will see for sure important results in the upcoming years. Uh, and then lastly, I discussed new targets of stimulation. And this goes back to my earlier comment that with neuromodulation, you can go exactly where you want to be, also targeting non-dopaminergic uh, circuits. Uh, and I discussed substantia nigra pars reticulata stimulation, uh, which is a target I mentioned earlier. Might be promising. Uh, there, are, there was more interest in the past. Uh, there is a recently uh, concluded a large trial in Germany, but the results are not available yet. It's been a while, and I wonder why this is not the case. Perhaps implying that it's not as effective as it was supposed to be. Um, other researchers, like uh, Monica Potter in uh, in Hamburg, have tried to understand why SNR can work. Uh, it was initially seen as a purely motor benefit because the SNR is the output station together with the G with the GPI or the basal ganglia. Uh, but uh, this new research indicates that perhaps the effect is more related to nor noradrenergic connections and overall effect on attention, which also plays a big role in gait. Uh, other uh, targets of interest are the um, PPN and the brainstem in general. PPN was a very interesting target, uh, especially uh, 10 years ago or so now, uh, after a few you know, few studies done, uh, we our expectations are by far reduced. Um, uh, the effect is variable and it's not always the greatest, if anything. Um, and that's because the PPN degenerates. And also PPN is a very heterogeneous and widespread nucleus, and it's difficult to really understand how to stimulate it. Some people argue they need to be stimulated at the, in the caudal part. Some people have done adaptive stimulation of the, of the PPN, like Michael O'Kuhn in Florida, uh, where they did uh, stimulation of the GPI and PPN, and PPN was triggered by alpha activity in the PPN itself. Uh, the results could be interesting, uh, interesting to see. There were some patients indeed doing better, but uh, the others, uh, to their surprise, uh, reported a, a high number of uh, complications. And perhaps uh, it's not that surprising because these are very uh, advanced Parkinson's freezing of gait, especially when it's resistant to medication, indicates a widespread pathology. And also these patients have received four electrodes, two in the GPI and two in the PPN, which is a brainstem nucleus. So it's quite a challenging uh, and um, impactful type of surgery. Uh, um, then, so in general, I don't really have a lot of expectations anymore with PPN. Some people have argued that the effect of PPN is actually mediated by stimulating a target that is not far, but is more, um, 
uh, dorsal to the PPN, that is the cuneiform nucleus. It's not a cholinergic nucleus, it's actually mainly glutamatergic and GABAergic. Animal studies have indicated that, that stimulating the cuneiform nucleus actually induces stepping uh, and even running. Uh, so it makes sense to look at this, and uh, there is a possibility to stimulate the PPN and or the cuneiform nucleus using the rational leads once again. And a study done by uh, um, uh, Karim Karachi and Barilo Walter in Paris have shown that two years later, in a double blind fashion, PPN or cuneiform nucleus stimulation are basically providing the patient with very, with very little. Um, uh, benefit. Uh, so um, this means that, uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, as promising as we thought. And when comparing PPN and, and cuneiform nucleus, um, in reality, um, uh, it looks like PPN stimulation is even more effective than cuneiform nucleus, if anything. But there are there is at least one other study that is ongoing trying to answer the same question. Um, we uh, in the past we looked at uh, freezing of gait caused by lesions as a good model for freezing of gate resistant to dopaminergic treatments. And we identified, uh, this is work done together with my Fox in um, Boston, uh, that uh, two areas in the brain were particularly, particularly relevant to this problem. And this is the um, locomotor region of the cerebellum and the thalamus, which receives indeed from the cerebellum. So we thought that PPN stimulation can be effective when the electrode is close to the fibers leaving the cerebellum to go up to the thalamus. And we didn't find this. We just looked at our data and we didn't find any connection. And interestingly, we in that instead find a connection of uh, uh, a correlation with improvement between uh, DBS in the PPN area and the medium lemniscus, which was hard to explain initially. But then we learned that there is a company uh, that is working on stimulating the medium lemniscus to improve freezing of gait with the idea that that can give a sort of sensory cueing to patients. Um, so they use the term of uh, writing the brain. Instead of reading the, the brain, they write to the brain, giving this paced uh, sensation that can be beneficial to freezing of gait. And there's a, an ongoing trial in the States right now. Uh, moving down, uh, there's a lot of attention to spinal cord stimulation uh, that is approved for pain. And initially, it was quite uh, uh, effective in people with Parkinson's and pain. And probably the effect on walking in that regard is because of the improvement of pain. Uh, it's been done in patients without pain uh, in an off-label fashion, and the effects are variable. And some groups report dramatic effects, which I believe is mainly placebo. We had done a study, we didn't see much. Um, uh, but there is another interesting approach using spinal cord stimulation that is uh, done in Lausanne by, by Gregor Cortin's group. They don't really do stimulation of the dorsal column of the spine. They stimulate the dorsal roots and they stimulate in a pattern fashion, which is highly individualized to move the legs. So basically they activate groups of muscles to mimic the physiological progression of muscle activations that we have during locomotion. And they started doing this in people with spinal cord injury. So that's why they looked at ways to move the muscles. Um, and in a study that was published not a long time ago and was seen with a lot of interest everywhere in the world, they'd done this in spinal cord injured patient in one patient in particular, using the, a cortical implant to trigger the stimulation in the cortex in a way to bypass the lesion of the spinal cord level. The same can be done in Parkinson's. In this case, you are not bypassing the spinal cord, you are bypassing a defective basal ganglia. So M1 triggering stimulation of that type in the spinal cord. The study is completed, it's, under, um, it's um, about to be um, uh, published. And they did the same approach in monkeys uh, with the model of uh, Parkinson's, and that was successful. And they did it in one patient, uh, but in this patient, instead of using a cortical implant, they wanted to test if in a less invasive fashion, they could do the spinal cord implant that I mentioned earlier, triggered by a wearable on the patient's uh, leg. Uh, and that was effective. In one case, there was uh, having freezing of gait in spite of optimized SDN, DBS, and levodopa. So very interesting approach, more to come for sure. Uh, challenges is that this is quite expensive. As I mentioned, it's very individualized. Uh, and so I don't know what's the feasibility on large scale for now, but for sure in the future, we'll hear more and more about this. 
Um, and since I mentioned the cortex, I also want to say that uh, in the past there have been studies in, in uh, animals and even in humans doing motor cortex stimulation for freezing of gait. And that seems to be effective in humans was short living and probably placebo related. Uh, now we are thinking that maybe uh, that's because we are not stimulating in a closed loop fashion. So we are not stimulating when needed. Uh, we have now evidence that the cortex can be used uh, to uh, understand the brain intention to activate stepping. So probably the next step, the next step would be to use this implanted, implanted device on the cortex to record, but also stimulate the cortex at the same time. So we will see um, where we go in that regard. Um, these are the major um, uh, new targets that I mentioned. Uh, and then I also talked about non-invasive stimulation, as I mentioned uh, before. Um, non-invasive stimulation is not as promising as I, as the other ones, in my opinion, because anything you achieve is short living because it's something that is external to the patient. Uh, but I still see value in these technologies to understand the targets of stimulation, perhaps for invasive treatments, but also because that can be combined with uh, new rehabilitation. So the patient can be receiving rehabilitation intensively. And at the same time, this can be combined with a synergistic approach using these neuromodulation techniques. And these techniques are mainly uh, TMS, repetitive TMS, which seems to be promising for freezing and stimulating the M1 or the supplementary motor area. TDCS, not too much until a recent publication where TDCS over the cerebellum was effective when triggered by the particular gate phase. There are a few others, and maybe one that is quite fancy lately is vagal nerve stimulation, where the stimulation is uh, either invasive, and it's been done for epilepsy in humans and in experimental models of Parkinson's disease. But interestingly, this can be done in a non-invasive fashion. There is a device already commercialized for migraine that stimulates the vagal nerve stimulation at the cervical level. And there are some data indicating some effect on freezing of gait, but then it's, uh, they need the replication. Vagal nerve stimulation has projection also to the uh, external part of the um, uh, ear. And therefore, you can stimulate that part. You can stimulate the vagus also with a device in the inner ear. Um, and even that has been studied. And there are some small studies indicating a possible benefit on gait. So we will see. Uh, so yeah, this is in a nutshell what I discussed and where the literature is at this moment and also where it's going, as I mentioned. And I'm grateful to the many people that uh, very generously decided to uh, give me their unpublished material so that I could present it during the MDS.